Here we utilize Glidewell's digital treatment planning services and the following is a recording of the web-based teleconference that was conducted to review the digital plan. This simplifies the process in making sure that we're able to visually determine the position of our dental implants prior to any surgical intervention. Hello, Dr. Kaczynski. Hi, how are you doing? Good. I wanted to welcome you to our first WebEx we're doing together here. An old friend and a very experienced implantologist, so I don't need uh, to obviously tell you anything about how to place implants, but what I wanted to do is just go through with you the views we have with the Simplant software. Yeah. And we had tentatively dropped in the implants where you had uh, requested them, and then what we can do is go ahead and change those per your, your recommendation since you're ultimately going to be the one placing the implants. So just to walk through the screens real quickly for those people listening that aren't familiar with the software, this is, this is Simplant and the implant that you requested is Cybron and I believe that your, your request was you're going to put Octa on one side and a hex on another just for uh, educational purposes and show the differences in how you take impressions but the implants themselves will be identical. Correct. Okay, so just to walk around the, uh, the horn here, on the bottom right you can see a, a three-dimensional rendering of the case. It's obviously a maxillary case and looking at replacing uh, maxillary first molars uh, bilaterally. And then, so what we have done is segmented the case, and you can see that, and we'll go ahead and blow that view up. We can change the transparency of the, of the bone. In this view, you can see, you can see the patient's uh, maxilla. You can see where the teeth are. And then you can also start to make out the sinus. And then what we can also do in this view is we can show and hide things. So if you uh, just wanted to see where the teeth are in relationship to where your implant's gonna be. We can remove the bone. We can look at things at all different types of directions. The other thing we've done here, since this case was scanned without a, uh, a scan appliance, we have dropped in virtual teeth. Pretty straightforward since obviously they just go in between the, the teeth, the adjacent teeth. Just gives us a better idea of how to plan it restoratively. Okay. So that's, that's the, the three-dimensional rendering. If you go above it is, is the axial view and we move this scroll bar, we can move up and down the axial slices, and obviously one of the first things that pops out in the axial slice, and I'm sure you're well aware of, is some kind of a pathology in the sinus. It looks like a, most likely a, a polyp or mucosal, and so it looks like you have a, a pretty large polyp on the patient's right side and a thickening of membrane on the right side. And go ahead and feel free to interject or jump in there, Tim. You bet. As we go through this, then over on the upper left is a uh, cross-sectional slice. And if you see this yellow line that follows along the arch of the maxilla, you can see the blue line. That's what you're seeing here. So you see we can move that cross-sectional slice around. So right now we're looking in the area of number three. And then the, the bottom left is a panoramic view. Okay, and again, this is a good view to show how... There's your, your uh, mucus seal, or potential mucus seal, and then you can see over here the thickening of the membrane on a patient's left side. Okay. We'll go from there. Let's start with number three. And Tim, let you take it from there as far as uh, what you want to do with this. Right now we had left it uh, just short of the sinus or a little bit into the sinus, and you can, you can uh, give us your two cents on, on how, you would, how you would treat this case. Well, one of the issues that we have in the posterior maxilla, uh, obviously, is the large sinuses living in Michigan here. We have a lot of patients that have very large sinuses. And our concern is, can we actually place implants? Do we have the, the quality and quantity of bone um, that we need to predictably place an implant, a long enough implant? And with CTs, we're now able to, to measure um, the amount of bone that we have in three dimensions. And what's most, what's most important is taking it one step further in a case like this, is taking a software pro program like Simplant and being able to virtually place the implant prior to ever touching the patient is a tremendous advantage for me. So rather than, than guessing or hoping that I can get an implant in the proper position, I'm going to know exactly, precisely where and where, where I want to place the implant and if I'm able to to indeed place the implant without doing more invasive procedures, such as a true sinus um, um, elevation or sinus augmentation. So in this situation, um, using the Simplant software, 
we're able to take our, our implant, we, we measure the amount of bone that we have, and we see that we have approximately nine millimeters of bone to the true floor of the sinus. In the number three area, we do have some pathology there that we're not exactly sure what it is, but we, we can gather it's some kind of a, a mucosal or, or, or polyp. And what my intent is, is to tr always try to put the longest, fattest implant we can in any individual situation, obviously uh, being very conscious or very aware of the prosthetic limitations. Our crown and root ratio has to be um, positive enough so that we don't overstress the area. Uh, in the maxilla, our, our major concern is that we just don't have great quality of bone. Nobody does. The, the bone is light, it's porous, um, and we have to deal with that. So again, we always want to use the longest, fattest implant. Using a, a tapered implant, um, such as, as the Cybron um, design, um, does give us an advantage in that we're not going to perforate and place the implant into the sinus. It, we would have to make a, a huge mistake to, to do that. So using the software, I'm looking at the, the floor of the sinus, um, the, the, the um, um, floor, and we, we, we can actually lift that membrane up. I feel comfortable lifting it up to three millimeters. So placing a nine millimeter implant uh, in that area really is, is not invasive. We're not going to perforate the sinus membrane, and even if we did, I wouldn't be overly concerned if it's a small opening. But I would feel very comfortable. We have great buccal lingual uh, width, and we have adequate mesial and distal width. Our, our concern is our, our, um, our height of bone that we need to work with. Mm -hmm. So again, using the software, we're able to determine that we do have adequate bone to place the proper implant in the proper position. Okay, so right now, we look at our uh, list of implants. We have uh, 4.8 by 9. Uh, if we went into uh, Cybron and we look at the next longest implant, just to, to give, you, give you an idea from, from a virtual standpoint, it's easy to do things virtually. That's the beauty of this. If we go into Cybron, okay, our next uh, longest implant would be an 11, and let me just show you that. Okay, so now you're getting, you're definitely making more of a jump. So I guess the question I have for you would be, would you either st stay with the nine and do a little bit of a bump, or getting a little more invasive when you have to go into a little bit longer implant? Knowing that um, we do have some pathology in that area, the decision was made to put a nine millimeter implant in. What I'm trying to virtually determine is um, to keep the implant away from the natural teeth. I want them at least two millimeters away from the adjacent teeth. We have plenty of mesial distal width, so that's not really a concern at all, but we can measure that. Um, buckle lingually, we're pretty much in the center of the ridge. We want our forces to be down the long axis of the implant, so we can really ideally place that implant pretty much center in the ridge. If we didn't want a surgical guide, we could pretty much eyeball these situations. Um, or we could create a, a surgical guide and um, do it that way. Right, and it looks like you have a, you have a nice, a huge width here. Uh, the the uh, ring that is around the implant is one and a half millimeters, so it looks like we've got our, you know, well over a one, one and a half millimeter of bone surrounding that implant, so that looks, looks like it's in pretty good shape. And Brad, if I can interject, what's, what's so nice about the, the technique that we're using is this is a flapless procedure. We're basically using a tissue punch to make an opening in the tissue and um, doing our, our procedure, our surgical placement of the implant um, flapless. And I feel very comfortable with it because I know exactly what kind of bone we have to work with. What's nice about the, the Cybron system too is having the, the, the neck 4.8 uh, millimeters in diameter and it tapers down uh, to a 4.1 body. Again, I know that we have a definite stop we, we're not going to be able to push that implant into the sinus if, for, for whatever reason, we, we made an error. Um, having that wide diameter neck really is an advantage in the posterior um, maxilla. Sure. Okay. Very good. Uh, then now we're, we're on to number 14. So you can see here, let's go ahead and we're going to hide the implant for a moment just to show you the, uh, here, here is your height of bone. And then it looks like you've got a thickened membrane. Can you measure that, uh, Brett? Can sure. you measure it from the crust to the... Absolutely. So the crust is about there. And that's about to the floor of your sinus. 
So you're about about uh, seven and a quarter millimeters. Right. Okay. So if we drop an implant in there, um, then it looks like then if uh, the shortest implant with Cybron is is the nine millimeter. So you're going to be uh, just over a millimeter and a half into the sinus. And as I said earlier, um, I have no problem plumping up um, or tenting that membrane, especially a thickened membrane like this, a millimeter, two millimeters, up to three millimeters, without a problem, without causing any any um, um, problems later on with the sinus. Okay. Would you ever have a, a time where you would go ahead and do a, a full sinus lift on this type of case, or do you feel like... Well, again, you know, that's a great question. Absolutely. And, and the d determining factor is how much do you want to put the patient through. If we have decent quality of bone, we have decent, we have a lot of width of bone, we have good buccal lingual width of bone, uh, we have a, a strong implant um, uh, that, that is going to self-tap uh, into position, so we're going to get initial stability, which is wonderful, and we have a crown root ratio that allows us to place a shorter implant rather than a longer implant. I think those are the advantages of, of knowing what we need to place in this situation, where this, this implant software allows us again, virtually placing the implant to determine it. Now, if our crown root ratio didn't allow that, or if the bone was thinner, where we knew we didn't have as much initial stability, well, yes, then maybe we would want to do a, a full window and a full sinus augmentation, allow it to heal for five, six months, and then go back and put a, a longer implant. Then in, in this case where you have, you can see the floor of the sinus goes up on the, on the, the palatal side, as far as angulation, do you want us to have it here, or do you want us to straight? Yeah, I would probably upright it just a little bit. I would bring the the um, the apices maybe to, to the left of the screen. Yeah, maybe a little bit like that. Yeah, that's easily done virtually. And, then and again, looking at the uh, looking at the the buccal lingual um, with the the facial being on the left side of the screen that we're looking at. All right. Right side screen being the lingual, and we want the 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 occlusal forces to be down the long axis of the implant. And again, having a wide ridge like this really gives us an advantage. Um, oftentimes when, when we lose a tooth, the bone will, will shrink towards the palate and will shrink up. So we don't have as much room. So the implants are necessarily placed more lingually or palatally, which can create some issues. We're gonna get some cantilevering there. But in this situation, we really don't have that concern. Right, and I think if you look at that, the virtual tooth, you're right down through the uh, the central fossa. It looks like you're right over the stamp cusp of the of the opposing. So I think that, that looks like in pretty good position. Beautiful. Okay, great. Then as far from here, then uh, this is a great di diagnostic tool. Then we can go proceed however you'd like to before the surgery. We could either uh, you could freehand this one based on the information you now have. We could make you a conventional surgical stent, or we could order a uh, surgery guide from Materialize, and you can just let us know which way you'd like to go with that. And, and one of the advantages, too, for, for maybe more inexperienced doctors is I would suggest um, a, a surgical guide, whether it's a uh, directional guide to help you in the proper direction of the implant um, or a true depth determining uh, guide, which obviously can be done that you just mentioned, Brad. Um, it really allows us a lot of comfort, a lot of safety, and really puts the patients at a, at a certain comfort zone, especially in a, in, in a historically difficult situation or a, a little bit, a, a situation that we were more concerned with. Um, the designs of implants are changing. We're seeing these real short implants all the time. They're trying to address problems that we have every day in our practices. So um, the implant software really allows us a lot of versatility uh, and to help us establish a true comfort zone for the wide variety of, a wide range of experiences that, that the clinicians have. Very good. Okay, great. Well, we look forward to working with you on this case and and seeing how it turns out. Our first slide here illustrates the CT radiograph. There's no distortion of the panoramic view and cross-sectional views of the edentulous areas where the implants are placed in the first molar re regions. Note the position of the sinus. Simple panoramic radiographs or periapicals do not necessarily give the three-dimensional image achieved with CT scanning. So this is a very important tool. Periapical or edentulous maxillary right first molar area is illustrated in this radiograph. 
So, but how much vertical height of bone do we really have to work with? Is, where is the sinus position? And where do we want to place our implants? Here's a view of the retracted smile. Our patient missed her maxillary first molars because it made her feel less than whole, less than ideal. Here's an occlusal view of the number three area. It appears clinically that we do have adequate width of bone, but the CT will give us an exact interpretation of the amount of bone we really have. Just looking at the soft tissue intraorally does not necessarily exactly give us the amount of bone that we have to work with because there can be a significant amount of soft tissue. The Cybron implant system is simple and precise, and we're going to demonstrate the technique, the surgical technique, in the following slides. The first drill used to initially determine angulation is the Lindemann guide drill. This is very sharp drill with a point, and it also cuts on the side, which allows lateral positioning um, or placement uh, of the implant because it does cut on the side. The Lindemann guide penetrates the soft tissue and the bone and we'll go in about several millimeters so that we can determine angulation. A digital radiograph is taken to determine the angulation of this primary first drill. If we needed to move the position, we could simply do that because we didn't really penetrate the bone very far. We could move it mesially, distally, or work on the angulation as we wanted to. A sharp tissue punch blade removes the soft tissue at the surgical site and eliminates the need for a full thickness flap. So this is truly a flapless procedure. Sutures will not be required following implant placement. Remember, bone is not innervated. There's nerves that run through bone, but there are no pain receptors in bone. The only discomfort that the patient would feel is the small incision made in the soft tissue. So most of our patients will only take a Tylenol tablet postoperatively. It really is not a painful procedure. Firm pressure is used with the tissue punch to make a nice, clean, circular incision. Here we're showing the occlusal view of the incision made with the tissue punch. The soft tissue is simply removed with a, a curette. The tissue plug determines the depth of soft tissue at this site. Here's an occlusal view of the incision and initial osteotomy site made with the Lindemann guide drill. Nice, clean, very, very little blood uh, in the area. Here I'm simply using a perio probe to determine the tissue height in that area. And we're a little less than three millimeters of tissue height. These next three slides demonstrate the, the next size drill, which is a 2.2 diameter twist drill, is used to establish the depth, our final depth of the implant. The black lines are clearly delineated at 7 millimeters, which is the bottom of the first black line, 9 millimeters, the top of the first black line, 11 millimeters, the bottom of the second black line, 13 millimeters, the top of the second black line, and 15 millimeters, which is the third thin line. We're placing the 2.2 diameter twist drill into the site. It's following the initial osteotomy made by the Lindemann guide drill. And we're measuring to the de predetermined depth that we wanted. Now remember, we had almost 3 millimeters of soft tissue. So if you look at this drill, it looks like the we are at a depth of 11 millimeters, which is the bottom of the second thick line, but we have 3 millimeters of tissue, so it's going to allow us to put a 9 millimeter implant in position. Here's a radiograph illustrating the angulation that the implant will be placed in in the center of the ridge. The drill was placed about 9, 10 millimeters into bone. You can see on the uh, radiograph that the um, notches on this 2.2 twist drill are clearly delineated. 7 millimeters being the first notch in the bone, then 9, and then 11. So we're not quite at 11, so we're at 9 or 10 millimeters in, into bone.
We then go to use a 3.3 twist drill, and the actual diameter of this drill is only 2.8 millimeters. And it's positioned so that an osteotomy 9 millimeters into bone is made. We predetermined that using our CT guide that we were going to place a 9 millimeter implant. Note again that the soft tissue was almost 3 millimeters in height, so in determining a visual on how deep to place the implant, the 9 millimeters we want the implant to go into the bone is added to the 3 millimeters of tissue height. Therefore, the line markings on the twist drill is visualized to about 12 millimeters. Thus, the visual is in between the second large black line, which is about 12 millimeters. And here again, we're looking at the radiograph of the 3.3 millimeter twist drill in the site. Note the notches of the drill itself. Uh, the first break is at 7 millimeters. The second uh, indentation is 9 millimeters. And this was intended to be our final depth just at the floor of the sinus. So we're in really nice position here. We then go to a 4.1 millimeter twist drill with an actual diameter of about three and a half millimeters. We are drilling at about 1200 RPMs during these procedures. And the same procedure is done. We go to the proper depth. A radiograph is taken with the 4.1 millimeter twist drill in ideal position at 9 millimeters of depth. Here's the uh, external packaging of the Cybron implant system. You can see that we're going to be using a 4.0 millimeter by 9 millimeter long Cybron Pro XRT implant. The internal packaging of the Cybron implant system um, is indicated, so it's a package inside of a package. It's a 4.1 diameter internal hex design of implant. We open that package and you can see how the implant is actually uh, sterilized in position. Again, clearly delineating the size of the implant and the type of implant that we're using. When we break open the uh, internal packaging of the implant, you can see the internal design of the implant itself um, on the right hand side. Now with this system, a cover screw is also included in the packaging, and it's on the, in the other part of the, the uh, package. So there's no added cost for a cover screw. An Octa implant driver is placed into the handpiece and then into the internal design of the implant. The implant is retained quite readily in the implant driver. The motor is turned down to record 25 newton centimeters of torque. The implant is then driven into the osteotomy site and stops when 25 newton centimeters of torque is achieved. A radiograph of the implant in position. The tightness of the implant in bone is checked using a torque ratchet. These record torque of 15, 25, and 35 newton centimeters. We easily achieve 25 newton centimeters of torque on this implant in the maxillary right first molar area. Once this level of torque is achieved, we can either use a cover screw or a taller healing abutment can be safely placed into the implant to allow for tissue healing. Because we achieved 25 newton centimeters of torque in the implant in the bone, I decided to use one of the taller healing abutments to be placed in the implant to allow the tissue to form around it. This will eliminate the need for any secondary surgical intervention because the implant will not bury. The taller healing abutment will allow direct access to the internal design of the implant after integration has progressed. And here we see the internal packaging. It's a platform switched two millimeter long healing abutment which will allow a nice, a nice position. Here is the healing abutment in a hex driver, a hand hex driver that will be used to place this healing abutment into our implant. This is an occlusal view of the implant in position immediately after placement through the tissue. You can see there's very, very little bleeding, uh, very little trauma. The healing abutment is placed into the internal design of the Cybrine implant, tightened, here we'll go back and 
use our torque ratchet to place our healing abutment into the implant at 15 newton centimeters, which will prevent any loosening during the healing phase. And here we can see the healing abutment in position, very little or no bleeding, no sutures were required. This is a very non-evasive treatment. Facial view of the same. Here we're showing a radiograph of the Cybron Octa implant in position immediately after surgical placement. Note the platform switching design of the healing abutment. Here we see the, the tissue healing around the healing abutment after four months of integration. The patient had no symptoms postoperatively and only took a Tylenol for discomfort the day of surgery. It is an amazing technique, an amazing surgery, and very, very well received by our patients. Here, we're simply going to, after integration has progressed, and routinely we will say four months of integration in the maxilla and three months of integration in the mandible is adequate, although a lot will determine on the, the um, compatibility of the bone, the um, a tightness of the implant um, on placement. So here we have to remove the healing abutment um, from the site, from the tissue. We're going to save this because we will put it back in in a few minutes. A direct impression is planned. The impression system is a two-piece system with an octagon base which engages the internal design of the Cybrine implant and the screw which threads it into position. A hex tool is used to place the impression coping. The two-piece impression coping is inserted into the implant. A radiograph is taken to ensure a complete seat of the impression coping. This is a mandatory protocol procedure to ensure that the impression coping engages the implant completely. You can't have any separation or black lines between the impression coping and the implant. A polysiloxane impression is made with light and heavy body materials. Note the clean contours of the impression. The impression coping must be retained properly in the impression to ensure a proper abutment and crown fabrication. There's no voids uh, in this area. The impression coping is removed and placed into a laboratory analog which simulates the implant design. And here we have an analog and the impression coping is simply hand tightened into position. The impression coping and analog is carefully placed into the implant impression. Now you could uh, allow the laboratory to do this uh, under magnification if you prefer. The healing abutment is replaced in the mouth while the dental laboratory is fabricating a uh, master cast using the implant analog to fabricate the proper abutment and crown. Again, the healing abutment, uh, you can see the tissue around the healing abutment and we will remove this prior to placement of the prepared abutment that the laboratory uh, created for us. So we're using our hex tool to remove the healing abutment. Here, the prepared abutment is torqued into position at 25 newton centimeters, and a radiograph is taken to ensure complete seating of the abutment into the body of the implant. A piece of cotton or silicone is placed into the screw hole after torquing to place and a little cavity is used to cover the screw hole prior to crown cementation. I always want to be able to get back to my implant itself uh, if there's any problems. If there's problems with, with the crown, with uh, porcelain chipping, uh, contacts, or if there is any, any uh, infection or problems around the implant, it's nice for me to be able to remove the crown, remove the abutment, and get back to the body of the implant um, if I need to. Different designs and types of crowns can be fabricated by the dental laboratory, including aesthetic and durable zirconia crowns, conventional porcelain fused to metal crowns, or crowns intended to be used for bruxers, like the bruxer solid zirconia materials. In this situation, it was determined that the zirconia crown was the most aesthetic and would be the most durable. The translucency appears to be the best of the three choices um, that I just gave you. That's zirconia. Here's a PFM. You can see uh, just a traditional PFM crown and the Bruxer solid zirconia crown, which is rather opaque. 
The zirconia crown creates a warm essence. The PFM was much more opaque. And the Bruxer crown uh, was opaque but, but very durable. So we decided on the zirconia and we cemented the zirconia crown into position. It's the final radiograph of the implant retained maxillary first molar cemented into position. Here we're showing a um, digital radiograph of the contralateral maxillary left first molar, the edentulous space, and ideal position of the implant. The healing abutment, as we demonstrated earlier, is placed immediately after a flapless surgical procedure. Here the healing abutment is in position and removed using a hex tool. A tissue cuff around the integrated cybrine implant here is illustrated. Here you can see the internal design of the 4.1 by 9 millimeter XRT Pro cybrine implant. Here a hex design impression coping is used. Uh, again, it's a two-piece system that engages the internal design of the implant. The impression coping is in position and checked for complete seating using a radiograph. And here, a little bit different than the other side, here we have the platform switching design, um, whereas we use a more conventional technique that engaged the outside of the body of the implant uh, previously. A polysiloxane impression is made using light and heavy body materials. A nice clean impression of the impression coping is made. Now, if you look at this impression, you can see on the very top of the impression where the implant would be, you see a flat area. And the impression coping does have a flat side to it, so it allows you to, to replace it quite readily. The impression coping is placed into the implant analog used by the dental laboratory to simulate the actual implant position in the mouth. The impression coping and analog are placed into the final impression. The healing abutment is replaced and torqued into position while the dental lab fabricates the prepared abutment and crown. And again, the healing abutment is in position. The dental laboratory will then prepare the titanium abutments and the final crowns that we will place in the mouth. The healing abutment is again removed from the mouth prior to prepared abutment seating. You can see a little bit of plaque around the, the healing abutment. Here's the body of the implant. Here, the abutment is taken to the mouth. A hex driver is used to engage the internal design of the implant and the abutment is torqued to 25 newton centimeters. The abutment screw opening is again covered with either silicone or cotton and cavet prior to crown cementation. A radiograph of the abutment in the proper position. Again, choices can be made on the type of crown that you want to use, whether it be a zirconia, a PFM, porcelain fused the metal, or a material used for Bruxers like the Bruxer solid zirconia material. Here, a zirconia crown was chosen for its aesthetics. This slide illustrates a porcelain fused to metal crown try-in, um, and you can see it's not quite as aesthetic as a zirconia crown. And here, the Bruxer material is very opaque and not very aesthetic, but very durable. And our last slide shows the final radiograph of the zirconia crown in place in the maxillary left first molar.